Hey, welcome everyone. Um, we'll give it a few minutes as people join in, but uh, we are talking scale competition. We are talking, um, I'm losing my thought. <laughs> We're talking scale maneuvers. What what does that all mean? So as we, um, as we wait for folks to join, I'll give you guys a little bit of a recap what we did last time. So in our last live stream, and I do have a link to that in the, de the description for this one. Uh, if we talked about scale competition, what that's all about. We talked about the static portion of the competition because we are gearing up for the AMA Nationals. Uh, and that occurs on July 6th. Uh, and so I'm really excited that we've got the uh, B-58 is well underway. And so I'm hoping to have it more or less flyable here soon. Uh, but I do plan to fly it once. It's all painted and all that because if nothing else, we'll get some cool pictures if something <laughs> happens. But anyways, let me officially welcome everybody uh, to the show. Thank you so much for, for joining in. And so we are talking about the AMA Nationals. We are talking about scale competition. Uh, and so today what we're talking about is the flight portion. What does that all mean? What does flying scale really truly mean? Uh, and so I'm excited to get into it. And we've got a really special guest with us today who's also a very good friend of mine that I've done a lot of flying with. Uh, and so, as I mentioned in our last live stream, we did talk about scale documentation. If you're curious about any of that, be sure to check that out. We went in full detail uh, what is required. And not all of the classes at the AMA Nats do require scale competition, or I'm sorry, scale documentation, but they do all require flying. And so we're going to drill down on that today. Uh, and so as we transition, um, I can't stress enough the importance of the flight portion of the scale competition. That's where the rubber meets the road. Uh, and so there are five required maneuvers, there's five optional maneuvers, and we're going to go through all of that. Uh, but otherwise, in the meantime, so let me give you guys a quick B-58 update. The last video posted last week, uh, and so that covered all of the landing gear installation. That was a huge, huge milestone. And I'll be honest, it took me <laughs> a whole lot longer to get all of that done than I expected it to. I spent uh, probably over a month on just the landing gear alone trying to get all of that situated because there were a lot of, of uh, geometry challenges based on all of the motion that you get from the landing gear, which you can see. Um, and so that nose really moves a ton. And so as well, the mains, they fold up, they flatten. Uh, and so uh, it was a huge, huge milestone. Uh, from here in the next video, it's gonna be the propulsion installation. Uh, the fans are going in. Uh, I'm gonna be pinning all the hatches uh, and also getting the canopy in. Uh, and so uh, I'm working on that now. The fans are actually in the airplane behind me and I'm working on uh, the video now and I'm hoping actually to get some taxi testing in very soon uh, that we I can also include in that video. Uh, but otherwise, some of the the one of the big questions I've gotten a lot is, will the airplane have the external tank? And yes, yes, it will. And I hope to fly with it depending on on how the weight works out. <laughs> Uh, and so I also want to give you guys, here is a sneak peek at the 3D printed uh, exhaust nozzles. These are the J79 nozzles. Uh, and so these are printed on a resin printer, extremely high detail. Uh, and so they came out fantastic. All right. So let's get into it. We're going to talk. I want to bring our guest on now. Uh, and so... Um, I want to introduce to you guys my friend Brett Becker. Uh, he is a two-time Top Gun champion. Uh, we have flown together for a long time, Brett, uh, and so I, I can't thank you enough for being on the show. Uh, and so, why don't you got? Um, why don't you give everyone kind of your background and uh, yeah, let them know who you are. Well, thanks, Chris, for having me. Um, Chris and I both grew up in Southern California, and modeling. He was uh, often flying at Mile Square Park and uh, my home field was the Sepulveda Basin. So um, uh, 
learned how to build and learned how to fly, did a lot of slope flying on the cliffs and uh, on the weekend would do quickie 500s or uh, uh, Formula One racing at the basin. That was really uh, my passion growing up. But uh, I learned to fly on a, a Cox 049 Cessna Skylane. That was my first model and uh, it's just evolved from there. So Awesome. And so where, uh, where did your passion for scale, when, when did that come in? I'm going to pull this up here for you. Good question. Um, I, I think like so many modelers, scale modeling was initially what piqued my interest to get into the hobby, but I wasn't really ready initially to do that. But uh, it was always an interest of mine. So I started, um, you know, simply covering a, a balsa wood P51 and, you know, chrome monocode and scratching panels and trying to make it look like more than it was, you know, even though that it had fixed landing gear and uh, every, every scale model se seems to build upon the previous one. You learn new techniques and methods and uh, you know, it's, it's just really an, a never ending evolution. And uh, for me, just refining skills and learning new ones. That's true. And, and I will say uh, your models are built with, surgical precision <laughs> your your u2 uh that you won top gun with i mean it was just immaculate uh, from the pictures inside and out so um yeah it's really cool all composite airframe you did all of the layup on it i don't did you make the molds for it too i, I think you acquired the molds or I did not. The, the molds were uh, made by a gentleman in Texas. Uh, his name was Renee Sines, and he was a, a very passionate U2 fan. And he spent a lot of times making the tooling for this. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, he wasn't able to finish the project. But that was that was kind of where I, I took the project on to to see to see it through to completion in his honor. So, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Hobby View wants to know more about the Tony. Why don't you address the Tony behind you there real quick for, for Fitz? Sure. So um, that uh, that's a Don Smith plans uh, KI-61. It was built by Ed Newman, um, I believe sometime back in the 90s. And uh, I, I got it not too long ago. And my goal is to convert it from glow to electric. But um uh, Ed and Frank Tiano flew this in team scale many years ago at uh, Top Gun when it was at the Polo Ground. So looking forward to, to doing a restoration and getting it back in the air. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, the uh, I mean, you you have a history with the Tony, right? There's a this is a Tony here that you competed at Scale Masters with. Uh, I remember flying with you with that airplane as well at, oh man, how many it's like been over a decade or more. <laughs> it, it was a while ago, but I remember specifically you and I having conversations at uh, the scale masters about routines with it. And, yeah. you know, whether or not to go with the touch and go maneuver or to maybe go with something a little safer. So yeah, um, I, I, I do distinctly remember that. <laughs> and actually that's a that's a good segue because uh we can start to kind of get into the the actual flight portion of it but really quickly um why don't you give a little bit of information on the xp70 we've got right here too so that's a really unique airframe that you don't see um yeah so uh the the xp70 was uh, you know it was uh, an airplane that i've always liked and but um when I moved to Dayton, Ohio, and the, you know, the sole survivor XB70 is here in the museum, that was when I really got interested in trying to make a model of it. So um, this one took several years to really iron out the flight qualities, uh, you know, over four seasons every year, it seemed to um, make some improvements, uh, dialing in the gyro, um, change the landing gear position just so that it handled better on the ground. Uh, and I, I really enjoyed flying this airplane while, while I had it. So. Oh, it was a, an extremely cool airplane. I, I got a chance to see it fly out of top down and, and it was pretty, pretty awesome. And you know, that, that Delta approach is unmistakable, right? You get that not nose, 
nose up attitude and and uh, just use the power to to get it down to the ground and and you know it's b58 is going to be exactly the same so it's pretty pretty awesome it, it did really well at high angles of attack really enjoyed takeoffs and landings it was really predictable at one time you were looking at making that forward canopy movable. Did you ever implement that on the model? I, I did. I, it, um, it took an entire season, but uh, it ended up, uh, I lost the airplane about a year and a half later. So uh, uh -huh. that was the first part that went into the ground. So there's nothing left on that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's too bad. <laughs> uh. All right, so why don't we get into it a little bit, Brett? I appreciate you sharing um, your background, and and gosh, we go way back. Uh, and uh, you know, I can't. It can't be overstated how how much of a big deal it is to win Top Gun, not to mention win it twice. And so, uh, congratulations to you again on, on those accomplishments. It's pretty pretty amazing. Thank you, and. And same to you, two-time scale master champion, too. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, interesting, right? We've both won, we were talking about this uh, before the show, electric jets, right? I think 2013, no, 2016 when I won with the Mirage, that was the first electric jet at scale masters. Uh, and then your U2 was first electric jet at Top Gun, is that right, to win? The grand champion or yeah there you know um bob violet won designer scale with his uh his f80 and um there's team scale champions with the uh, with the russian b29 um and uh, so there's been you know there's been a history of successful electrics at uh top gun but the the u2 was the the first to win the overall um top gun champion awesome uh, so let's talk about flight maneuvers uh, in a scale competition, scale format. Uh, this is a pretty unique way that that the competitions are set up, right? So last time um, in our last segment, we talked about static judging and what that all means. Uh, and so not all of the uh, not all of the classes, competition classes require static judging. Uh, some of them, there's fun scale, uh, sport scale, those just, you get a, you know, you prove that the airplane is of a scale airplane and that you get an automatic five points or 25 points or something like that, but you, they all have to fly, right? So, um, the importance of executing maneuvers well, um, and, and choosing the right routine, you know, is going to help set you up for success in the competition format. Uh, and so when we talk about the AMA nationals and the, the require that actually, let me, let me go back. When we talk about flight competition, uh, as a whole, right. You, you get five required maneuvers, five optional maneuvers. So the required maneuvers, um, are takeoff fly past for AMA Nats and us scale masters. They do a figure eight. Uh, and then landing and realism. And for Top Gun, it's a slow speed, dirty pass in place of the figure eight. Uh, and then from there, it's five optional maneuvers. And these are anything that you can select as the contestant uh, that is prototypical of the airplane. Uh, and so in the case, in addition, um, there are some mechanical options that can be exercised. Uh, in the case of the AMA Nationals, uh, there are, you can choose up to two Top Gun. It looks like there was one you, you were able to select retract as a mechanical option. Uh, oh, it looks like I, I didn't fully fill this out. So, so for AMA, there's retracts, multi-engine. Um, I can't remember some of the others, but those were the bomb ones drop. that most say it's, oh, bomb drop. Bomb drops. Um, Josh, uh, if, if you're doing um, crop dusting, I believe that that would count. Oh, yeah, yep, that's right. And so in the case of scale masters, there's only two mechanical options that you can choose. And if you have both, then you can use them. If you don't, then obviously you can't, but it's multi-engine and swing wing, folding wing. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are the only mechanical options you can choose in scale masters. Everything else has to be 
a part of a flight maneuver. They, they call it, uh, I can't remember the terminology, but you know, combo flight maneuver. But, uh, and so why don't we touch on the five required maneuvers first uh, and, and then we'll, we'll go from there. So first up is of course the takeoff. That, that's fairly self-explanatory, I guess, but um, the, the important things are, you know, making sure you're on center line. The, at the end of the day, you know, you want to make sure all maneuvers are executed smoothly. Uh, and so takeoff is no exception. Is it an erratic rotation to lift off or is it a smooth rotation to lift off? Uh, and so in the case here, they had the, the graphics. So you, you call the maneuver start and then you want to more or less try and, and target taking off in front of the judges. Um, and then of course it, the maneuver ends at about 10 feet. You call your finished maneuver. Um, I want to back up really quickly, something I forgot to mention. Um, and so when you go through your, uh, once you've decided on your, your flight maneuvers, your flight routine, um, you'll go through and kind of brief the judges and all of that. And, and we'll talk more about that later, but I want to mention it now because um, that's a really important part of the process and ensuring that the judges understand how you're going to, to uh, perform the maneuvers. There is guidance in the book, of course, uh, but if you're doing anything different to what the book says, they need to understand that. Uh, and so it, let me... Any notes on, on the takeoff portion? I'm going to pull up a quick example click or uh, clip while we do that. But did you have any notes on that, Brett? Uh, you know, it's just like you said, it's really important to, to explain to the judges how your takeoff is going to look um, because, you know, a, a takeoff is it's going to be different if you're a Piper Cub or an F-14. So uh, being able to help the judges visualize it before it happens really helps with the judging. And so this was a Hawker Hunter out at the 2019 scale masters. Uh, and so most of the example maneuvers I'm going to pull from this flight routine. Um, I believe this, the pilot of this airplane ended up winning the uh, pro-am one of the pro-am categories, but he flew the model very, very well. And what I want to point out is, uh, he's locked on the center line, the whole takeoff roll. Uh, the rotation is good, maybe a little fast, but it's still good. Um, and so this is a very, actually now the rotation was, was pretty good too. So, and, and he's on runway heading on the climb out. I mean, this is a very, very good example of uh, takeoff in a competition format. Let me go back here. All right. So next is the figure eight. Uh, Hobby View had a question. So Fitz had a question about gyros. Uh, I I know gyros are allowed in Top Gun. I'm not sure I saw anything about them not being allowed in the AMA Nats. Uh, I need to double check on that. Do, do you recall seeing anything in there? Uh, <clears throat> I don't recall off the top of my head. Yeah, I, I think that they are allowed at the AMA Nats. Uh, U.S. Scale Masters is different. They're, they don't allow um, gyros necessarily. thing is, you know, if, if it's set up fairly passively, uh, they'll, they'll kind of let it slide but in, at Scale Masters. But if it's a pretty aggressive gyro, then they're like, no, that's you got to turn that off. So. Uh, all right, so figure eight, and this is what I call the man maker. <laughs> so the figure eight is performed in a very unique way, uh, and it is a very challenging maneuver uh, to execute well. Uh, and because the way that it works is you come in from the start here on the figure, if we look where it says start, you call maneuver start, you fly you know, towards, uh, you fly runway heading and then you turn out 90 degrees from where you're standing. So you basically you wanna be facing 90 degrees away from you in front of the judges. And then you turn the opposite direction, perform a 360 degree turn, that crossover point where you turned out 90 degrees at first, you wanna make, 
made up with that cross over point as you go out the other direction and you do the, the opposite turn and then you exit out the same runway heading. It's, it's a, I, I like it as a maneuver uh, because it is a really excellent, uh, it, it, it's challenging. And so um, I, I like to see it in the competition. Uh, okay, so we checked on the gyro question. Uh, gyros are allowed at the AMA Nets. So we were able to track that down for you if it's uh, no heading hold features. It's, uh, so that's, thank you, Lee, for, for digging that up for us. Uh, and so you have a lot of experience with the figure eight. How, how do you enjoy this, the, <laughs> this one, Brett? <laughs> Uh, you know, it, it definitely it definitely separates the pilots in terms of their their experience with the with with the airplane that they're flying, and also with you know piloting skills. It's just it's so difficult, and you know every flight there's going to be different flying conditions, crosswinds, headwinds, and uh, you really got to know the airplane and be comfortable with adjusting the throttle to to make that uh, intersection point. And uh, if you can do it well you know, kudos to you. Yeah. And, and in this case, it looked like he actually lost some altitude there on the turnout. Um, it's hard to tell from the angle of the video, but, uh, you know, it's about having two concentric circles. And if there's wind at the event, you got to adjust your bank angles to try and get those concentric circles while also maintaining your, your crossover point. Um, it's, it's, yeah, like I said, it's I call it the man maker because it, it does <laughs> it does challenge you. You you wouldn't think that such a simplistic type of maneuver would be so hard, but it but it really is. Very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> Hashtag the man maker. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, let's go back here. All right, figure eight. And if you guys have any questions at all in the comments as we go through this, please let me know. Uh, you know, Lee will make sure we get it covered. And uh, yeah, if, as much as we can um, answer your questions, we want to. So, uh, all right. So the next required maneuver is the fly past. All right. So this is just a straight flyby. Uh, it is... deceptively difficult, right? You'd think, oh, you're just flying a straight line and you're good to go. Uh, but there, there's some, some important pieces of the puzzle here. So when you start from maneuver start, you want to be in between 10 to 20 feet altitude. Uh, and you want to maintain that constant altitude through the entire maneuver. And, and that's where it can get challenging is keeping that constant altitude. Uh, and so let me pull up an example here. Um, sorry, I wasn't able to preload a lot of these as we were going. Uh, here we go. And so in the case of the hunter here, he actually looks like he might have been a little bit high. Um, but very good. Otherwise, constant altitude is very apparent. Uh, in in this particular maneuver, uh, I, I actually have a, let me pull up a different example where you don't see as much constant altitude through the maneuver. Here we go. So you can see a little bit, so the altitude is good here, but you can see a bit more variation through the entire maneuver as he's going through, pitching up and down a bit. Um, I had a question here. So, uh, hold on, I gotta remove that. There we go. Uh, how much do you practice these maneuvers before the actual competition? I think these might be fun to do as a fun competition for local clubs. Uh, so for me, I will practice, practice as much as I can realistically uh, before the competition. In the case of the B-58, I'm not sure I'm gonna get a whole lot of practice. Uh, but, um, any practice you can do is going to help you in the long run. Uh, and you know, it'll help you memorize the routine too, because guess what? If you go out of order on your call out sheet, 
to the judges, then you end up getting a zero for the maneuver. So, um, see, so it helps you memorize and it helps uh, train kind of that muscle memory for the maneuvers. And you want to practice going from right to left and from left to right because you never know where the wind's going to be uh, during the, the competition day. What about you? How how much practice do you like to do, Brett? Uh, I think the more the better, um, but uh, in some cases there's not always time allowing that. Uh, in, in the case of uh, the U2, I didn't get a ton of time to practice, but it turns out I was using uh, a routine similar to the XB70. So it was something that uh, me and my caller we were comfortable with when it came time to the competition. Yeah. Yeah. The more the better. That's that's the end of the, that's what it's all about. Uh, it's amazing that a lot of guys will show up at a competition not having practiced. And in many cases, because they're flying a new airplane <laughs> that they, they recently finished. Uh, but yeah, other times they just you know, decide, oh, I'm just going to come out and do it. And that's totally fine. Um, let's see. So this question came up. Are those judges good pilots themselves? Uh, you know, you don't have to be a good pilot to be a good judge, to be honest. Um, and, and we're going to touch on this in a little bit, but you, you end up briefing to the judges how you're going to fly the maneuvers. And I, that, the importance of that cannot be understated. Uh, because that tells them how you're going to fly the routine. And so that gives them the basis to judge by. Otherwise, they have to draw on their own experience. And, you know, no two judges have the same experience, right? So if you tell them exactly what you're going to do and you perform that, then you should score well. I think I think the most important thing with the judges is that, that they're judging consistently, uh, regardless of, of who who's in front of them so that at the end of the day, after they've judged the entire, um, you know, competition, you know, everybody they've judged once that it's consistent from start to finish. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. So the last required, well, sorry, there's two more, uh, but the physical last physical required maneuver is landing. Uh, and so this one's self-explanatory think, you know, take off in reverse, if you will. Uh, and so, uh, let me pull up an example. Do you have any comments related to landing recommendations? Let's see. Um, not, not in particular, although it, it is somewhat unique in scale competition, mm -hmm. uh, Top Gun and uh, the Nats that, you know, you can choose whether you want to land on the paved surface or the grass surface. So, um, you know, unless it's clearly stated otherwise, you can choose to take off on pavement and land on grass or vice versa. Um, and, and that can help depending on the, the conditions you're flying in. Yeah, I know for tail draggers, especially, you know, being able to take off from, from grass is very beneficial because the pavement can be pretty tricky in terms of ground loops and stuff. So this is a very nice example on the landing. And you notice the correction, the rudder correction, to stay on center line. So yeah, this is very nice, nicely executed landing. So of these required maneuvers, oh, sorry, let's, there's one more. So flight realism, and I forgot to mention this at the beginning. Uh, so flight realism is basically the, the score of the flight as a whole. So how realistically did it present, you know, was it indicative of the full scale airplane? Uh, was it prototypical? Were you doing, you know, the right maneuvers? Did they present right? Uh, and so the, the big ones, was it smooth? Was it stable? Was it flying at a scale speed? I know at Top Gun speed is a, a real big one <laughs> that they, they really stress upon. Uh, and so, but, but it's just kind of an interesting, um, interesting element uh, to the, the flight portion of, of um, the judging. So otherwise, we get five optional maneuvers. And so these are anything prototypical of the airplane. So if it's an aerobatic airplane, you want to be doing, you know, you can do loops, rolls, variations thereof. Uh, and then if it's non-aerobatic, then, of course, that's that's you're a little, little bit more restrictive. Uh, and so, you know, 
uh, uh, for me, I want to choose my maneuvers smartly, uh, do maneuvers that I know that I can execute well. Uh, like for example, with the A7, um, it, it, the, the other part of it is, is because <laughs> I got your dog there, <laughs> um, because of the airplanes being electric, you know, choosing maneuvers smartly that also minimize full throttle. Uh, and so that way you can extend your flight time as much as, as is practical. And so, um, Let's see, the question is, are there any instances where battery life prohibits a competitor from finishing a routine? Uh, so the answer to that is it all has to be done in the same flight. And so uh, that's where choosing the right maneuvers that extends your flight time is critical. Uh, so the Mirage that I competed with at Scale Masters that I won in 2016, uh, I was pretty limited on flight time with that airplane. But I went through and I, I changed out the fan, I changed out batteries, and I did a bunch of stuff to, to lighten it up so that I could extend the flight time as much as possible. And the other part of it was I was very deliberate about the maneuvers that I chose. So I only had two full throttle maneuvers, and that was a the takeoff, and I performed an Immelman, and that was it. Everything else was partial throttle. Uh, and so that really extends the flight time considerably. And, and it was the same actually for the A7. I did a very similar flight routine with the A7. Uh, and so what about you, Brett, in, in terms of, you know, selecting maneuvers, what's kind of the process you go through? Um, so there's, there's definitely electrics that don't have the endurance to do a complete routine. So, um, you know, if, if that's the case, you know, you, you fly nine maneuvers and instead of 10, but, you know, you get through the event. Uh, in the case of, uh, it, it, I can think of at least one airplane that I've flown in scale competition where I chose a touch and go. It's because you do, you basically, you get two maneuvers in one pass. So that's a way to kind of reduce the overall flight time. Um, and that's yeah. helpful, but, you know, touch and goes can be risky. So you do that when the conditions are conducive to that and safe. And if not, you know, um, you have to choose another maneuver. Yeah. And that, that goes back to, you know, being smart in terms of, of the maneuvers that you choose. So is a touch and go smart? Maybe it is for the airplane that you have. Maybe it isn't right. Um, in your case, you, it, that was with the, the Tony that we were looking at uh, early on. And I remember that, and you did that specifically because of the flight time restrictions that you had. And, and so you were able to get the full flight routine by doing that. Um, and so that is, that's all part of the equation and, and, and um, setting yourself up for success and being able to get through the full routine. Um, I want to mention that, you know, just because the airplane can do a four point roll doesn't necessarily mean you want to execute a four point roll because that is a more difficult maneuver than say just a standard aileron roll. Uh, and also there are actually variations of roles. There's a victory roll, there's a barrel roll, there is a military style roll. Um, and what every airplane that I've seen will always initiate a slight up elevator, um, perform the roll. And so there is actually a slight arc that you get in the rolling maneuver typically. Uh, and so these are all things that you explain to the judge. And, and so that goes down to this, this last bullet here, whatever is being flown, the whole flight routine must be briefed to the judges first. So you go through and you, you know, for me, I, I like to give them a little bit of a show. It's like, I'll shake their hand like, Hey, welcome. And, and thank you for being here. And, and we'll talk through the maneuvers. And, you know, one by one, okay, we got takeoff. This is how we're going to execute the takeoff. Um, and you just go through maneuver by maneuver, how you're going to do it. And so in my case, I performed a military role. And so I said, okay, I'm going to, when I call maneuver start, I'm going to initiate a two to five degree pitch up attitude. I'm going to roll 360 degrees, centering the roll in front of the judges, um, such that inverted is right in front of us. Um, and so same thing with like the Immelman. So I'll call a maneuver start. I'll fly past. I'll pull up 
and such that the rollout is, you know, right in front of us. And so um, it's it's very important to talk through the judge through the maneuvers with uh, the judges. Uh, I'm sure you go through much the same thing when you're out of Top Gun. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just trying to explain to them, you know, if, if they haven't watched videos of the full scale of what I happen to be flying, I try to describe it to them so that when it happens, they're not surprised. So perfect example is, you know, the, the Lockheed U-2 looks like a sailplane, but it has an incredible um, thrust to weight ratio. And so if you ever watch a full scale takeoff, yeah. they almost do a vertical climb out, which you would not you know, expect by looking at it. So, yeah. you know, I, I brief the judges on that well in advance and, you know, they're they're So when they see it they're that's, that's what he described. So um, do yeah. that, that significantly helps the, the flight score. Yeah. If, if you don't explain to them what they're, what you're going to do and how you're going to do it, then they really don't have a basis to judge by. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's extremely important. So we've got this question to the judges deduct points for maneuvers, which would be possible with the model, but would not be done by the real aircraft. My recommendation would be to choose a different maneuver, uh, something that is prototypical of the full scale um, versus something that isn't because that kind of defeats purpose, what, what they're trying to do. And what, one last thing on the optional maneuvers, one, one judge gave me, you know, a, uh, um, feedback that that there's no um there's no scoring uh that's scaled on the complexity of the maneuver so if if you're if you're flying a more difficult maneuver you don't benefit necessarily from that so try to choose those maneuvers which you feel like you can score the max points on that's a very very good point simple keep it simple yeah simple maneuvers are going to to be easier to score well on uh, yeah because there is no difficulty rating <laughs> that's a very good point uh, okay so just really quickly this is the sample um, score sheet and so um, you know you just fill in the maneuvers you can do your maneuvers in any order that you choose and so um, that is you know you have the freedom to do whatever you like just so long as you touch on <laughs> The, the necessary maneuvers, uh, the five required and then the five optional. All right, so let's switch gears now. We, this is Brett's routine from Top Gun. Why don't you talk us through uh, what you did and I'll pull up some of the video clips while you do that. Sure, so um, the, the U-2 is a non-aerobatic aircraft, uh, so um, in addition to the, the required maneuvers, um, my optional maneuvers were fairly straightforward. And I was, in reality, I was pretty limited on what I could perform with this plane. So um, the, in addition to the required, um, it, it seemed to perform well in the Shondell, um, which is why I chose that. And then the the procedure turn was also one of the options as well as the um the overshoot and the military pattern those those were the optionals in addition to the retracts and um these maneuvers worked out pretty well regardless of the flying conditions in uh lakeland florida where top gun is held is well known for having um uh, very strong crosswinds coming from either direction, depending on the day. So um, this, it turns out that this is the same routine that I flew for the X-70 Valkyrie. Yeah. Uh, here, let me restart this. So this is the U2 at um, Rosewood, but this is, you were going through your routine at, um, and so, yeah, this is, there's that climb out you were talking about, that scale climb out. And I've seen videos of the U2 and it is quite impressive <laughs> what they do on the takeoff. Uh, so, so how would you score this takeoff looking at it? 
Well, probably not a 10 because it wasn't lined up on the runway. Yeah. Um, but I'm, you know, looking at it, it, you know, the, the U2 has the outer wing pogos mm -hmm. um, and they fell off as, you know, design. So I'm happy about that. But yeah, the, the plane wasn't lined up on the runway. So there would definitely be a deduction. Yeah, it looked like they fell off during the rollout. Yeah, about right there. So, so were they gravity? They just fell out, or did, were they actuated? Do you like have him pinned? So, so the real one is just gravity because the full scale, the wings sag so much that once they fit up into that socket, they're there until the wings lift and then the the oh, pogos fall away. Um, it didn't sense. work out. Sorry. Oh, I said that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I tried to do that on the model, but it didn't work the same way. So ultimately, they were. Um, spring loaded, but also had a servo to um, pull a pin that released them. So, okay. Um, but they do fall out before the plane is in the air. Okay. Uh, so then the Shondell, uh, why don't you actually explain what that maneuver is while I pull up the, the video clip? Sure. So the, the Shondell is, um, it's basically a 180 degree climbing turn um, where the at the 180 degree point happens at the same point at which it started, but at a different altitude. Um, and so are you doing this at full throttle at this point? Um, it's a pretty high throttle setting to get up to that point because... Yeah. It's definitely full throttle for the first half of the turn. Okay. So, and so you would call probably maneuver start about right here. And then right in front of the judges is where you would start your, your turn. So you fly past and, and climbing 180 degrees. And so that, that entry point and that exit point, you should be level going two different directions, right? Exactly. Yeah. And the, the U2, it, um, a descending 360 would be a great option um, for, for this non-aerobatic model. But um, I really didn't have enough drag devices for it to descend um, in one pass, which is why, why that wasn't appropriate for this model. Right. Uh, so we had the question, do you get points off for non-scale speeds? And the answer is yes. Yeah. So... Uh, they're especially big on that at, at Top Gun, uh, but if the airplane is flying, if it's barreling through the sky extremely fast, that will play into your realism score. Um, a big part of that, uh, it may not necessarily come into play in each of the individual maneuvers as much, but it will impact the realism considerably. Uh, so the next next one you had was the the procedure turn. So why don't you explain that one? So <clears throat> so this is where you turn out. Yeah, it, it's basically half of a figure eight, right? Yeah. So it's a it's a ninety degree turn followed by a hundred and eighty degree hundred and eighty degree turn. So um, you basically, the maneuver starts and stops right in front of you, um, going opposite directions. Yeah. And so that's a nice flat maneuver. Doesn't necessarily require a bunch of throttle, uh, changes, right? You can do it at partial throttle. Um, it might be a little redundant with say the figure eight in the mix, but that doesn't mean you can't do it. It's, it's a perfectly viable maneuver. Uh, the one thing I would consider based on how much time it takes to do the figure eight, doing half a figure eight is still going to take a bit of time when we're talk trying to extend the flight time as much as possible. Mm -hmm. The, you know, depending on the, the competition that you're at, um, you know, this is kind of a, a risky maneuver because you're going against the, the pattern and, and, you know, at Top Gun, you can have five flight lines. So, you know, having having your caller being aware of the other aircraft is, you know, very important for a maneuver like that. Uh, I want to pull this up real quick. 
so yeah, th this keeping a scale speed is difficult. <laughs> it is, it all, all adds to the challenge, but you know, it, it's, yeah, it's all part of it. Uh, okay, so let's do, we'll do the high speed pass and then we'll do the slow, dirty pass at, at kind of at the same time. So uh, we'll go through the high speed pass. That's that's just a fly pass, right? Um, and the, I'm getting lost here. So the fly pass you had on this video was really nice. I thought it was very well executed. So you come in, you set your altitude, set your airspeed. Okay, maneuver start and constant altitude throughout, constant heading, maneuver stop, right? And it was locked in. Yeah, that's a beautiful example. Um, any pointers for the fly past? Um, you know, it's the, the U2 happened to have performed that very well, but you know, I, the, the judges, the judges take into account what type of aircraft you're flying. And so that, you know, if you're flying something that's very light wing loading, that's, that's perfectly okay. You know? Um, and if you're, if there's a crosswind conditions, they, you know, uh, experienced judges will factor that in so that any deviations are taken in context to what you're flying. So mm -hmm. really, um, regardless of what you're flying, you should be able to perform well and score well. Yeah. All right. So now we've got the slow speed, dirty pass. So this is gear down, flaps down, basically the same thing as a fly pass, but it's all dirtied up and it's slow. And so again, this is a very good example of that. And there was more throttle in the slow speed pass than there was in the high speed pass. Yeah, it makes sense. And so I just want to mention, if you, you're um, just joining us, we, we are talking about the AMA Nationals and, and uh, the flight portion of, of the, the competition. And, and so, uh, yeah, thanks for, for chiming in. Uh, so one of the questions that came up on the back end is, what happens if you have to avoid traffic during the flight? And that does happen. And so that's where your caller um, how, who's, who's calling the maneuvers for you is also citing the airspace for you too. So if you see somebody in the airspace, you, you know, you call, Hey, I'm going to do a 360 degree turn to allow the airspace to clear. Uh, and you know, everything that you're doing, you're telling the judges what you're doing. So they, they are aware of what's happening. Uh, and so, um, yeah, there's, there's no issues at all. If you have to, um, you know, reposition. But if you come in and call maneuver start, and then you you decide to reposition during that, it doesn't work. You, once you've called maneuver start, you have to complete the maneuver. Uh, otherwise, it won't um, it won't get scored well. Uh, so then we had uh, so after your slow speed dirty pass. Um, you went into, you did a, an overshoot. So you kept the gear and flaps down. Is that right? Right. So you're, you know, you're setting up for landing and it, um, it's not, it, it's designed to be, you know, looking like you're about to land. You start to, you know, um, get behind the throttle curve. The plane starts to flare, but it's happening, you know, too far out from where the intended landing point is. You call overshoot, you power up and you go around. Um, and in, in this particular case, I, I spoke to the judges before, and I explained that, you know, after, after the overshoot, we were going into the military pattern followed by landing. So it was all going to happen one after another. And would it be okay if I just left the gear down instead of cycling them again? And, um, they were, they were okay with that speaking to them in advance. So, for the entire military pattern, the gear remained down. Yeah. And that goes back to, you know, telling the judges what you're going to do. Uh, so we had this question come up about uh, what's the optimum height for the fly past. And so um, 10 to 20 feet. And, and actually for most maneuvering, except say if you're doing rolls or things like that, you may, maybe you want to be a little bit higher, but um, generally about, 20 ish feet uh, is, is a good altitude for most of the maneuvering that you're doing. 
Uh, okay, let me go back here. So then you had the military pattern, and, and I actually didn't pull out the, the clip for that, but then we have the landing. So let me pull up the landing. And in, in your case here, because it was a tail dragger and it didn't have the wing, uh, I, I can't remember what you called the, the, you know, the, the struts out of the wings. Yeah, the pogos, that's right. Um, you landed in the grass, right? Yeah, so with, with the U2 only having one center land main gear, um, you know, the one wing tip is always going to hit first. And so landing in the grass was the best option for this model. And because it was allowed per the, the rules, that, that worked out really well. But the, the landing on the U2 is by far the most difficult maneuver uh, for this airplane. So, Oh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, you've got that big, big high lift wing, high aspect ratio, it, it, probably slowing it down is not the easiest. <laughs> but that, you know, that's, that's the fun thing. Every, every scale model is going to have its own unique quirks and challenges. And so uh, it's part of what makes uh, scale modeling fun. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, yeah, so that is the, the, full routine you went through. Um, I did some similar <laughs> where the scale RC cars hold up the wings on landing. <laughs> you got to enter that in team scale because you need a teammate to do it. <laughs> That's right. Next one. <laughs> um, is there a sufficient wind direction change? Do you continue your intended planned routine? So when you present to the judges, the maneuvers that you're going to do, you can't change those mid flight. Uh, and so, but if there is a traffic pattern change, then you can, you know, they'll call the change and everybody will switch direction. You start doing the maneuvers the other way. Uh, so um, that's where, again, the caller is going to help you and, and let you know where, where you need to be and where to go. Uh, so guys, keep the questions coming. We're going to, we're getting near to the end here. And so I want to make sure we get all your questions answered. Uh, and so I wanted to touch base briefly, kind of what I'm thinking about in terms of the B-58. So in this case, I've got the multi-engine. I definitely want to take advantage of that. It's electric, so I shouldn't have any issues keeping all of them running uh, unless I've got a problem and we don't want that. <laughs> uh, there's the mechanical option for the retracts. Um, I may very well take that into account. Um, because again, if I can do the maximum amount of mechanical options, that's less maneuvers I physically have to fly. Uh, and so that helps with flight times. And so then I'm looking at takeoff, fly past, and then I haven't fully decided there's another maneuver I need to put in there. I thought about Shondell procedure turn. Uh, another one I like to do is a descending 180, which is kind of a high performance descent um that i've done in the past on other airplanes uh so uh, that's tbd so guys if you have any recommendations let me know in the comments uh, i'd love to know how many planes are flying at one time during the competition it depends on the competition and how many entrants uh at uh, the scale masters competitions i've flown there are four flight lines uh going at once at top gun i think there's up to five or more is there six or five at least five at times yeah uh and then i expect at the nats it'll probably be four to five um and everybody's talking to each other you know so if there are you know you need to clear traffic uh it's not a problem at all and and fai it's only one at a time so you know yeah. it really can vary depending on where you're at yeah, i'm not gonna lie having the airspace to yourself is would would be pretty nice <laughs> but that really extends things a lot right the, the, the length of competition takes much many more days to do that and you're going to end up with less flying too you may only get a couple flight rounds if you do everybody individually uh okay so then from there after the tvd i was thinking maybe a dirty pass um with the gear down uh because uh it's something I can do with the model. I, I really don't want to go the touch and go route if I don't have to, especially with the Delta and the weight of the model. Um, so, and then figure eight. 
And then I'll, after the figure eight, do military approach, overhead approach to the landing. And then, uh, yeah, that's kind of what I kind of what I'm thinking about. I don't know if, if you have any recommendations, Brett. Those, those sound like a good, a good routine for a, for a Delta wing bomber. Yeah. <laughs> Being a Delta wing, it, it's a little bit more challenging because the airplane doesn't fly on the wing as well. Right. It's, it's very thrust driven and especially if it's um on the heavier side given this has got you know four four fans i'm gonna have two big high capacity batteries so um yeah it's i want to try and be smart about the maneuvers that i select and make sure that i don't get into a situation where you know i cut myself short on the time uh, so how many judges at each station there are two judges at each station and so they score individually and then they will confer at the end of the flight round uh, and then um, they average that score together the, uh, the two scores together for your score for that flight round <laughs> could i drop a nuke i could actually i i don't know if you saw in the beginning i've got i've got i have the pod I could conceivably drop it, but I don't plan to. It's fiberglass and I don't want to mess it up. <laughs> but conceivably, yeah, I could drop that, the tank, and uh, as one of the maneuvers. And, and maybe it, it will be worth doing. I don't know. Um, we'll see. So um, if you guys have any other questions, we've got a few minutes left, but... Uh, otherwise, Brett, any any final thoughts you want to give to the viewers? Any final recommendations? You know, if you're if you're thinking of doing scale competition, say just go for it. You know, um, uh, a lot of modelers, it, it's easy to be intimidated just by the name of competition or the name of the event. Um, but I, I think you know these days there's a variety of different classes and. You know, if, if it's something that you're interested in, just, you know, jump in and do the do the sportsman class or, or do one of the entry classes, because even in those classes, the the flight portion is judged the same way as as all of the rest of the classes. Yeah, um, absolutely. And so uh, I think um, I, 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 I can't understate how wonderful scale competition is just to uh, challenge yourself to challenge uh, your your flying skills and your building skills. And, you know, oftentimes, you know, there may be uh, a lot of people you're competing with, but at the end of the day, you know, you're really just competing against yourself. So yeah. trying to improve from event to event and uh, it's a lot of fun regardless of where you end up. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because yeah, I, I want to encourage all of you out there to give it a try because it is not, um, it, it, it's fun. It really is fun. It will make you a better pilot, a better RC pilot. Um, and don't be intimidated. There's no reason to be. Uh, and if you're at the AMA Nats, please come find me. I'm more than happy to help you out. I will call for you or whatever you like, uh, because, um, there's nothing more, uh, that, I like to do them to help people. And so I really hope to see you guys out there. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I just want to encourage you guys to give it a try. Uh, let's see, Bob Bellamini had a question where to go. It's for you. Oh, there we go. Brett, what, what airframe will you campaign next? Inquire Thanks for asking, Bob. Um, <laughs> It's, it's going to be something unique, something that uh, you don't see very frequently in scale competitions, and uh, I'm still a ways out, but uh, I can't wait to get it out to the field. And I may or may not know what it is, so and I can't tell you, Bob, sorry. <laughs> All right, well, uh, I think that's it. We'll, we'll sign off here. Um, again, I want to thank all of you guys for joining us and... Um, you know, I am here to help. Brett is more than happy to help. Anyone at the competition is more than happy to help. And so um, I hope to see you guys out there. And uh, yeah, Brett, thank you so much for, for joining today. And 
Yeah, I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Chris, for having me. This has been fun. All right, guys. So with all that said, I got to end it off, you know, until next time. See you at the field.